13, chapter 1. Well, starting in verse 12, Paul says this to his beloved church in Philippi. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So let's pray. Father, again, as we open up your word and we um, delve into it, uh, we thank you so much for the uh, spirit, the life of Paul that has, through your spirit, has written these down for us. I pray that the spirit today will guide us in, in all truth. I pray that I will not misrepresent anything that is written here. I pray that uh, the spirit will be with us and that we can, um, we can learn from this. We can learn how obedient Paul was and how that gave him joy. Uh, and how obedient we can be, and how that will give us a lasting joy. Not the joy this world knows, but the joy that only you have to give. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so in this passage here, I was kind of going over, I, uh, as you can see, I don't, my vocabulary isn't as good as Chris's or Tim's or Jason's, because when I think of three topics that this, um, this passage comes out at me, I can't think of words that all start in the same letter. So I'll just give you my, the three topics that I think we can be drawn out of this. Number one is God's sovereign control over the spread of the gospel message. Okay? And then number two is kind of a corollary to that, which really is man's inability to impede that spread, no matter what they try to do. And then the third point that comes throughout really the whole book of Philippians uh, is Paul's joy. Paul's joy in spite of the affliction he's in. So as you recall, Paul writes this passage, writes this whole letter to his church in Philippi from prison, from prison in Rome. And so it's kind of a, the background of this is kind of important because it, it, it kind of goes along and shows why Paul writes what he does. But the question, you know, how did Paul get in prison? Well, started about four years prior to writing this letter, um, during Paul's third missionary journey, or after his third missionary journey, Paul returned to Jerusalem, um, was worshiping in the temple. He had cleansed himself according to the Mosaic law, was in the temple when this mob of Jews drug him out of the temple and started beating him. Uh, well, that caused a commotion, obviously, and so the Roman authorities came and they arrested Paul. Not that he had done anything wrong, but really to kind of save his life for his own protection. So Paul's placed in a prison in Jerusalem under Roman authorities. Uh, they're trying to figure out what he did wrong. So the, you know, the Jewish leaders at the time would come and say, well, he's not preaching the Mosaic law. He's telling things other than that. And so Paul had a, a testimony there that he gave both to those Jewish leaders and to the Roman authorities at that time. Um, and uh, as you recall, um, in Acts 23... Uh, while he, right before he was transferred to Caesarea, God spoke to him and said, as you are testifying here in Jerusalem, you must also testify in Rome. So Paul's sitting here in Jerusalem, in the jail. The next day, the Jews plot to kill him. They, they say, well, I'm not going to eat or drink until Paul's dead. So the authorities got wind of that. They didn't want their prisoner getting killed under their watch, so to speak. So they so they whisked him off to Caesarea, uh, where the Roman garrison was, a little more protection there for Paul. Um, and <clears throat> there, he again was able to, the Jewish officials would come and they'd testify, say he's doing all these things wrong. So Paul would again testify about the Lord to them, as well as the governor Felix there at the time. Um, and 
eventually to King Agrippa and Bernice, okay? So, so Paul's sitting there now in Caesarea. Uh, he's able to testify to the Lord what he's done, but they don't know what to do with him because he's maybe a threat to the Rome because he's got all this unrest. So the governor basically just leaves him in jail there for a couple of years really to pacify the Jews because they were kind of the ones that were, were angry at him. So eventually, though, um, he kind of goes on trial again, and he testifies again, and they say, okay, we can't find anything wrong with you, Paul. You haven't done anything to, to uh, break Roman law, so we're going to send you back to Jerusalem. Well, that's when he appeals to Caesar. You know, he, Paul is a Roman citizen, so that was his, uh, uh, he could do that, okay? That was one of his rights as a Roman citizen. He could appeal to the highest authority, which was Caesar, which was in Rome. So they ship him off to Rome. Uh, as you recall, that journey was not one that was very easy, so to speak. They were shipwrecked. He had to swim for his life. They landed on this, this island where, I don't know if you recall, they were around the, uh, the natives of that island, and, and this, this, this uh, snake jumps up and bites Paul on the arm, and all the natives go, he must have done something really bad because he's going to die because they knew that snake was poisonous. Well, he didn't die, so now they think he's a god. Okay, and in fact, he did heal some of the, the natives there as well, too. Finally got back, back on a ship and arrives at Rome, okay? And that's described, all that is described in Acts about 21 through, through 28. So Paul arrives in Rome as a prisoner. Now, you know, Paul had, had planned to go to Rome. Earlier in the book of Romans, he had, he had written to the Romans saying, you know, I, I have often intended to come to you, uh, but I've always been uh, prevented to. And he spoke of going on from there to Spain and spreading the gospel west. Um, well, uh, Paul, I don't think, you know, Paul planned his ways, but God directed his path. He didn't plan on being there as a prisoner, okay, but he's there, and he's there under God's, uh, under God's thing. So Paul then writes this letter. So, so Paul's been in prison by the time he writes this letter for four years or been imprisoned. He's been, he, his freedom is completely taken away. Um, prior to that, he was out planting churches, and then on his other missionary journeys, he went back, checked on the churches, made sure they had correct doctrine, things were going well with them. So all that was taken away from Paul for four years. Um, one of the churches he had planted on the second missionary journey was at Philippi. Okay, we talked about that at the beginning. In Acts 16, he kind of describes that. And, one, and Philip, the, the church at Philippi was always one that supported Paul, both financially, spiritually. Um, he kind of acknowledges that in, in later in the letter, uh, in chapter 4, verse 15, when he said, When I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. And even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So Paul had a good relationship, obviously, with this church at Philippi. So, um, but they had lost touch with him, okay? The, the, you know, he's in prison, so the church of Philippi kind of wondering where he was. Well, finally, they caught up with him, I guess, in Rome, and they sent a messenger to him. The name is Epaphrodites. Uh, Epaphrodites came not only with financial support, which Paul needed, um, but he also came personal support, okay, a friend to do things that he needed, um, and, and, and Paul knew that, that, you know, it had been four years and he hadn't heard from the church. So, so he kind of acknowledged that, you know, and, and later in the letter again, he says, now that Epaphroditus has showed up, he says, now I've rejoiced, rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So he kind of acknowledges, hey, I'm in prison. They can't, you know, they're having a hard time finding me. You know, there wasn't Facebook back then, like Tim said. I mean, it, it wasn't all over the media or anything like that. But they finally caught up with him there in Rome and sent Epaphroditus. So, so Paul then writes this letter back to the church of Philippi, um, really thanking them for support uh, as a report on how his, he's doing and especially how is his ministry doing, how is the gospel being spread. Because that's, that's what the church of Philippi want to know is, Paul, how you doing? How's the gospel working? How's your thing going on? How's it going on? Well, um, 
you know, I've been in prison for four years, okay? So from an earthly standpoint, you're thinking, well, his ministry is not doing much, okay? He's kind of stuck where he is, um, but God obviously had other plans. So he starts out then in verse 12 here. He goes, to the Philippians, I want you to know, brothers. The phrase, I want you to know, means it's, it means get this. Understand this. This is, this is important, okay? And, and this, this probably isn't what you're expecting from me because things have kind of turned out different. You know, you may have, you know, you, you're probably thinking, well, you know, he's in prison for four years. That his ministry is not doing too good. But not so. Uh, he, says, he says, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Okay, what has happened to him when well, four years he's been in prison? That's what he's talking about. Um, served to advance the gospel. That word advance, um, some of your translations may serve to progress the gospel. The, the Greek word for that is prokopi, which actually means progress against resistance. So a very appropriate word to use in his letter right there. Um, and it was actually used uh, in extra biblical times as, as uh, the progress of an army. Okay, always against resistance. And, and the verb form was actually means to literally chop down trees, kind of clearing a path for things. So that's kind of, that's exactly what's happened. What has happened has been against resistance, okay, but it served to advance the gospel against resistance. Now, I can't help but think when I was reading this that Paul, before he was Paul, when he was Saul, okay, what was he doing? I mean, he was trying to, he was the resistance against the gospel, right? He was killing Christians. He was putting them in prison. Um, but what did that do? Um, what did that do? In Acts 8.1, uh, there arose, this is, uh, again, speaking of right after, the, right after uh, Stephen was martyred and the persecution of the church started, uh, Luke writes this in Acts 8.1, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And then later on in Acts 11, now those who were scattered because of the persecution um, that happened over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. So what did, Paul, what did Saul's apparent animosity against the church and apparent uh, uh, trying to slow down the progress of the gospel do? Well, it actually... Send it, send it out. It, it spread it. I mean, it did exactly the opposite of what Saul wanted it to do, but exactly what God intended it to do. So in that respect, even though man's evil desires and evil attempts at stopping the spread of the gospel, ineffective, ineffective, because God is in control of that. Similar happened to Joseph, similar, similar situation. Joseph's brothers were evil, sold them into slavery in Egypt, okay? They meant it for evil, okay? They, they, didn't, they didn't think what was going to happen was going to happen. He'd be second in command and would save him somewhere down the thing. But no, they meant it for evil. Uh, as you know, Joseph then rises to second in command in Egypt and a famine in the land, and Joseph's brothers come back asking for food. Um, so, uh, and then in Genesis 45, when they finally do meet up, uh, Joseph and his brothers, okay? Um, Joseph said this, so it was not you who sent me here, but God. And then later on, he says, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. So again, here's an apparently evil uh, act with evil motives that, that God takes. He doesn't take that. He ordained that, that that was going to happen to use for the benefit of his people. Um, a very interesting psalm, but the psalmist, if you would turn to Psalm 7610, because that's a kind of an interesting one that kind of illustrates the same, uh, the same concept. Um, um, psalm 7610 says this, surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. Now that's a little hard to understand because it's written that way and so I actually went to a translation that I don't use very much but it kind of makes it a little clear it's kind of the same concept of man 
meaning it for evil, but God turning it around and using it as a weapon. The New Living Translation says this, human defiance only enhances your glory, for you use it as a weapon. So our wickedness, or, or man's wickedness, man's evil intents, um, God uses that as a weapon against evil. God turns it into good. Uh, God does that. I remember that. And um, But all that comes about because of what something Paul had written earlier in Romans. Uh, remember Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those that love God. Not just the good things, apparent good things to us, but all things. Paul's imprisonment, Paul's um, uh, situation at that time, you know, Paul had no possessions, his freedom taken away from him. Paul understood, though, that all things work together. Um, and in these things, we're more than conquerors, he says later on in that book. Um, one of Paul's later letter, letters he wrote after, as a matter of fact, the last letter he wrote in 2 Timothy, he says this, Remember Jesus Christ, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. So man may bind him, man may uh, attempt to slow down the progress of the gospel, may attempt to limit the progress of the gospel, but they can't do that. God's word is not bound down. So, and in a more recent thing, John Bunyan, I don't know, not Paul Bunyan, but John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Before he wrote that, he was a great preacher in England in the 17th century. So good, as, as a matter of fact, that the, the church of England threw him in jail. They didn't like his preaching. Um, so in jail, he'd stand out in the courtyard, and he'd preach as loud as he could. All the prisoners would gather. The town of Bedford would come. And even though they couldn't see him, they would listen to his preaching. So they said, well, okay, they wanted to put an end to that. So they put him in a cell down deep in the, in the jail where he couldn't do that. Um, well, all that did was give him two years to pen Pilgrim's Progress. Which, what did that do? I mean, that just went out. More people, as many people uh, read that as the Bible at a certain time. But what it did, they were attempting to squash his ministry by doing that. But what it did in God's providence was it allowed him to pen Pilgrim's Progress, get the Christian message out there uh, even more. Um, and even in today, places like China, where persecution of the church is rampant, the gospel is spreading exponentially. Uh, it really is. Um, but the ultimate demonstration of God using evil uh, for good is in the crucifixion. Evil men crucified Christ. Evil men with evil intentions crucified Christ. Um, and what did that do? Okay. It allowed him to conquer sin and death. It allowed him to redeem his people. Uh, it's God using evil men, evil's intentions to accomplish his will. So man has that inability to do that. But how, how, was this, how was this spread of the gospel? How was this happening specifically to Paul? Well, what were some of the things going on? Well, verse 13. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Okay, so, so Paul uses this word for imprisonment that he uses here is desmon, which, which literally means bound by chains or ropes. But it came to mean any type of forced confinement, okay? So, uh, but he used a different word for chains, like in Acts 20, 20, he uses having chains for the hope of Israel. In Ephesians 6, 20, I'm an ambassador in chains. That word is halasis, different word, which literally means a chain. And what it was used at this particular time uh, to speak of a chain that was about 18 inches long that had a cuff on one side cuff to the prisoner a cuff on the other side cuff to the guard 18 inches apart that was Paul's situation right then um, but what were some of the specifics of his imprisonment just so we kind of get an idea you know he was not in a prison cell um, the specifics of his imprisonment were really spoken of in Acts 28 um, in verse 16, he said, when he came to Rome, he was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Uh, in verse 23, he refers to it as lodging, okay? In verse 30, 31, it says he lived there two whole years, 
at his own expense. Okay. He welcomed all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So he's, he's not in a prison cell. He's in a house, basically under house arrest. There was no leg thing with the technology that could find him where he was. No, he stayed in that house because he's chained to this guard, this prisoner, 24-7. Okay, that means no privacy. Uh, when you think about it, you know, no privacy, um, no really avenue of escape. I mean, that was almost impossible uh, because you remember the Roman guards, they had, a, they had a good motive for keeping their prisoner because if, they, if he escaped, they would, the guard himself's life would be ended. If you recall in the Philippian jail, remember when Paul and Silas were in jail, okay, an earthquake came, all their shackles fell off, and, and the jailer was going to kill himself because he knew that his, uh, his boss was going to kill him or the Romans were going to kill him because the prisoners escaped. But Paul, you know, he said, no, we're all still here. You're good. He led him to Christ. Uh, that was one of the first, that was at a church plant in Philippi at that time. So, that, so that's kind of Paul's situation. In a house, but he's chained. Um, so who is he chained to? Well, it goes on to speak here. It became known throughout the whole imperial guard that my imprisonment was for Christ. So that's who he's chained to. But, but what, who's this imperial guard or praetorium guard, I think is in some translations. Um, well, that wor the word translated here, imperial guard or praetorium guard, is actually one word. It's just praetorium in Greek, which originally meant the tent of the commander of the army. It, ca it came to mean any house of a wealthy person, okay? But he's not speaking of a place here because it says here, it became known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest. So he's talking about people, okay? So he's talking about the praetorium guard, the imperial guard. So a little research on that. The praetorium guard um, was started by Caesar Augustus, he was a Caesar at the time of Christ's birth, okay? He took 10,000 men out of the Roman army, the, the best of the best, kind of your seals, your rangers, you know, those guys, and he would station them around Rome, uh, mainly as a, a show of strength, okay, to, because there's always a threat of an, of a, you know, an insurrection, especially a slave, slave revolt or something like that. So that was kind of his show of guard, but these were elite soldiers, so... When there's times of relative peace, they'd use these soldiers for other things. Like they'd be the guard at the Colosseum during the games. Uh, not only would they guard it, but sometimes they'd join in the games. Because, you know, they kind of what they did, you know, they would join in the carnage and stuff like that. Um, their their uh, term was somewhere between 12 and 16 years. And at the end of that, they, they'd retire as wealthy people. But the thing about this guard also is it held the power in Rome. They actually became those who chose the next Caesar, either by because they wanted to and by peace, or they'd kill the old one and put a new one in. But they held the power. So that's who Paul is chained to 24-7, um, which is interesting um, because it's interesting they chained to him 24-7 you know, Paul, you know, was allowed to preach in the gospel, so he'd have that avenue to spread the gospel. But what about, he's got a captive audience on the end of his hand. You know, it's, whole, it's one thing to be chained to him, but it's another thing for the guard to be chained to him. You know, what do you think he heard? Um, and, and the thing that made it so, um, uh, uh, the, way, the reason the guard would, would, would listen to him is because just think about it, he, he's, he sees them preaching the gospel and stuff like that. He sees them every other time as well too. He knows that Paul at any time could lose his life. They know that Paul is there only for preaching Christ. That was the only, he committed no crime, but he knew he could lose his life for that. Um, so they, they would see him preaching the word. They would see him not preaching the word. Uh, if there was any um, uh, any discrepancy there, 
they would know. But they would, again, think about that. They knew he's there just for Christ. He's caused, he, he really broke no Roman law, but he knew he could lose his life for it. So they knew the sincerity of his message. Okay. And we don't know how many of, uh, how many of them were um, converted. But later in Philippians, he, he says this, kind of tongue-in-cheek. Um, in chapter 4, verse 22, he says, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. So think about it. I mean, that's the imperial guard. That their, their main thing is to protect the emperor. They're part of Caesar's household. There's some saints going on in Caesar. So God has used Paul's imprisonment here to spread the gospel word, not only because they allowed him to. He had enough freedom to do that but through the guards that he was chained to 24-7. Through his imprisonment, that word was spread. Um, and then it says, not only the imperial guard, but all the rest. So all the rest is all the rest. That's everybody else. Okay, so, so people would, you know, Rome was not that big that word wouldn't spread. Okay, it's probably one as bad as Marshall. When, when word spreads pretty quickly here, okay? But word would spread. So they would know, you know, if there's a revival going on in this imperial guard, man, they, they'd know it. All the rest would know. Plus, they'd know it through his preaching. So the, the gospel is being spread here kind of two ways through Paul. One, through preaching the gospel. The other, through his imprisonment, through those in the guard. You know, you, you have to think, there had to be some saints at the Roman church that were praying, you know, how do we, how do we get the gospel into, how do we get it into Caesar's household? How do we get it into the hierarchy of Rome? Well, I mean, this is God's way of doing it. You know, it wasn't, a, uh, uh, it wasn't the way Paul had planned, uh, probably not the way any human planned it, but it's the way God planned it to do that. And then another way the gospel spread, verse 14, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So I read that verse. I said, now how, does that, how does that work? I mean, from a human standpoint, well, I see Paul's in prison. He's under confinement, no freedom. So I'm going to preach the gospel so I can go get in prison too. I mean, that's, that's the way my mind thinks. I'm sorry. I guess I'm a coward. But, you know, it didn't work that way. You know, they, they, would, they would see Paul. They would see... Um, his boldness, they see that he, he has joy throughout this. He's never, uh, never down about it. They see God's provision, you know, they, they provided for him during these couple of years in Rome. Um, and they're seeing that the word's being spread. And so it's kind of like that, that lead guy in the army. Somebody's got to run out there first and do it. You know, he may be killed doing it, but then it gives confidence and boldness to all the other soldiers around them to, to, to make the charge. So, so that's another way the gospel is being spread. It's, it's, it's emboldening, it's giving confidence to the, um, uh, to the brothers, okay, uh, in Rome and elsewhere to preach the word more boldly. So kind of three specific ways through that. But then Paul comes to verse 15, uh, on a little bit of a downer note, but he says this, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. So this envy and rivalry, again, this is, he says, this is brothers. These are, these are brothers who are speaking the true gospel. They're preaching the true gospel because it's not another gospel like Paul describes later in Galatians uh, 1 or another Christ. No, uh, in verse, verses here he says proc they proclaim Christ, they preach Christ. They, they, it's the gospel, okay, but they're doing it with the wrong motives. They're doing it out of jealousy, envy, uh, mainly for Paul, okay? They kind of wonder why, you know, why would they be jealous of Paul? I mean, he's in prison. Well, I mean, you know, Paul, Paul's Paul. He had a lot of success in his ministry. He planted many churches. The brothers knew that, okay? Um, so they were envious of him. They were jealous of him, okay? And and that goes on today. I mean, you know, that's in the church today. You know, don't kid yourself that everyone's preaching from sincere motives, okay? There's jealousy, there's envy, uh, and all that does is cause this rivalry, this strife in there. Um, so, so why did 
Paul mentioned that. I mean, you know, he's proclaiming the gospel. Well, you know, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned this so that we would know that this happens, that people are like that. Um, he also wants us to know that God sees the motives of people. Okay, and they will have to answer for their particular motives. So there's two groups he's describing here in verses 15 through 17. One <clears throat> is those that are preaching out of love for Paul, love and respect for Paul, and those out of envy, strife, selfish ambition. Um, and it says in verse 17, uh, again here, that those that are proclaiming Christ out of selfish ambition, okay, they're, they're doing it not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So their, their envy, their remarks, their slander was directed at Paul, okay? They were directed at Paul. And again, Paul doesn't give the specifics here. We don't know exactly what they were saying, but it was to afflict him. It was mean, okay? Um, and so it would be kind of fun to speculate some things they might say. One of the most common ones people would say, well, you know, Paul has some kind of hidden sin, okay? God's punishing him for that. Um, you know, another might be that, um, uh, you know, Paul, Paul, God put Paul there in prison now because he's done with him, okay? He, he's done what he needed to do. His gospel's kind of old. It's outdated. You know, you need to listen to my gospel, what I'm saying, you know, and that happens a lot. I mean, even today, people want, you know, what he said is not quite right. It's outdated. It's it doesn't appeal to the masses. Listen to me. Um, or they might say, well, Paul's lost the spirit. Okay. I mean, you know, if he, if he had the spirit, um, you know, he'd just, he'd just pray to God. Those chains would fall off and he'd go back to his, you know, preaching the gospel and, uh, and his missionary work. So, so he's saying, so he's saying God withdrew that spirit from Paul. That's why he's there in prison. He can't get out. Okay. Or some may just say something like, um, uh, well, you know, Paul should have been martyred a long time ago, okay? So he's just in there in prison. He's kind of playing politics with these guys, okay? So he's just kind of looking out for himself. So all these things, and they, again, those are speculations, okay? Uh, but they would be hurtful to a, a pastor, pastor like Paul with a sincere heart, uh, very hurtful. But how did Paul respond to this, Okay. Um, number one, or in verse 18, he says this. Okay, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense and truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And yes, I will rejoice. So Paul's rejoicing, even though he is the um, <clears throat> getting slandered, his reputation is you know, being slandered by brothers, okay? This isn't just people outside the church. These are brothers that are slandering him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so, you know, I can't help but think that, that Paul would just think of something he wrote back in Romans where, you know, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power unto salvation, okay? It is the power of God unto salvation. It's not, he didn't write, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because I'm the power unto salvation, okay? It is the power of God, power of God unto salvation. So he knew that the word was what would save people. It wasn't who was preaching it or really even what they were saying because God knew that the, if his word, those words were accurate, that word is what saved people. It had nothing to do with Paul. It had nothing to do with those, uh, those preachers that were doing it with an insincere um, motives, I guess. Um, it all had to do with the word of God. He rejoiced in that because that is why, um, that is what he was there for. That is what we are here for. Okay, so it kind of made me think, you go, so God can use these people with these brothers with insincere motives, selfish ambitions to spread the gospel? Well, it says it here, so I mean, that's true. And, and it made me kind of think back about uh, in the Old Testament about Jonah. I mean, think of Jonah. He, God told him to go over to Nineveh, tell those people to repent, you know, their evil stuff like that. Well, Jonah didn't like those people. So he went the other way. Well, God turned him around, obviously, had him swallowed up, had him regurgitated out. Um, and he, Nineveh repented because of, because of Jonah. 
Uh, but even afterwards, Jonah, he didn't like those guys. He said, why are you doing that, God? You know, why are you doing that? So Jonah really didn't have these people's best interests at heart, you know. But God used him in that situation. Just like he can use these teachers who selfish, ambitious, jealous to preach the word. And again, you know, we think you have to, why is God putting that in there to let us know? And I think it's to, to make us aware, okay, um, and to realize that God does look at the motives, uh, the purposes of the heart. But also, God, you know, Paul would look back, uh, Paul would also rejoice because if you look back in verse 16, what does it say here? It says, um, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Put here or appointed is another translation. I'm appointed to defense of the gospel. Um, so Paul is saying in that verse there, he says, the latter do it out of love. The latter of the brothers that are preaching the word, they do it out of love for Paul. They like him. Um, because they know that I am put here, I am appointed to defense of the gospel. And that, and that word appointment uh, is a good word, too, because it really uh, shows what Paul is thinking here. It means to be officially appointed to a position, okay, by somebody higher than you, okay? Um, but they didn't know who appointed. Sometimes it was used, it was translated destiny, okay? Destiny, obviously, is appointed by a higher position. But that same word is used in Luke 2.34, so I'd like to read that to you. By, if you recall, when, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus, to the baby Jesus, to the temple, uh, for a blessing, the old priest Simeon um, said this to Mary about Jesus. He says, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Same word. We know who appointed God, who appointed Christ for that. Um, but even before um, Paul, even when Paul was still Saul, okay, um, Luke tells us in Acts 19, uh, if you recall, when when he still had the, when Paul was blinded on the Damascus Road, he still had the scales on, he still blinded that um, God came to a, a saint called Ananias in Damascus and says, you know, go take care of, of Saul. And he said, uh, Saul, isn't he that guy that's kind of killing people like me? And, and he says, yes, but then the Lord said to Ananias, he says, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles, before kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer uh, for the sake of my name. So that's even before Paul even started his ministry. God had appointed him. God had chosen him to do exactly what he's doing in the gospel message. So, so again, Paul could rejoice because Paul saw the big picture. Okay, he wasn't concerned about uh, envy, jealousy, these people like that. He wasn't concerned about being in prison. Okay, um, you know, he could look back and and think about the Jews that that actually put him in prison. Okay, trying to stop him from doing what it was. He could look back at his Roman captors. Um, you know, that kept him there. Um, he could look back and, you know, he said, you know, when he, he's got no possessions, okay, he's certainly not a wealthy man. He has, to, he has to actually provide for his own self there in, in Rome, like he said. So, so Paul wasn't concerned with that. That's why Paul could say, I will rejoice. That's why Paul, that's why the theme throughout the whole letter to Philippi is Paul's joy in the midst of his affliction. I mean, it's, he's, in, he's in prison. He's in jail, okay? Um, and that's because he knew he knew for a fact that God's word would be spread in spite of all earthly things that attempt to stop it. So think about that. His joy, Paul's joy, Paul's rejoicing was not dependent upon his circumstances. Okay, he's in jail. He's in prison. Okay. Um, it wasn't dependent on his freedom. Okay, for four years he'd been in prison. He'd been, he couldn't go do what he wanted to do. Um, matter of fact, the last two years, well, the last two years, he's got a buddy with him all the time, chain killed. So uh, that really puts a hinder on you, right? Uh, had nothing to do with his possessions. He had none. Um, 
It really, his joy wasn't dependent on his reputation because he was being slandered by brothers in the church. But he says, I, I rejoice in that because the word's being spread. Um, so his joy really wasn't dependent on any earthly thing, okay? Um, his joy is dependent on, on God, okay? He knew that he was being obedient to God. He was being obedient to the spirit that was in him at this time. He was doing exactly what God intended him to do, and in that he rejoiced. Everything else didn't matter. So I ask you today, ask us today, you know, what about you? I mean, what about your joy? Um, you know, you have to ask yourself these questions. Is my joy really dependent on my circumstances? Are things going pretty good for me right now? Um, well, that can change, okay? Um, does my joy depend on my, um, uh, my possessions, okay? Um, that can change, okay? Does it depend on my health? Well, that can change in a moment, as we all know. Um, does it depend on any relationship with a person? You know, a lot of people get their joy out of somebody else. Um, that can change. That can change. Um, the only thing that can't change is God. And so our joy cannot be dependent on any earthly thing. Um, you know, even another person, you know, you, you, even your husband, your wife. I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of callous to say that, but it's true. Um, so, you know, the joy that Paul experienced, the joy that, the, the lasting joy, the eternal joy, um, is really a gift from God. You know, it's, it's being made in us by the Spirit of God living in us because we, we love the Word of God, we obey the Word of God. It's going to have trials, okay? It's got nothing to do with trials. It's completely separate from trials, anything bad that could happen to you, as Paul can testify to. Um, but that we should keep our focus on the eternal God and what he has done for us. So, you know, Paul being in prison, you know, I don't think there's any any verse in any of his letters where Paul said, why me? Okay, I don't think so. Correct me if I'm wrong there. No, but he always said, thank you for using me. And that's the way we should all, you know, should all see it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again so much for this letter from Paul. We thank you for his example of joy in the affliction of his life. We thank you so much for the gospel message that we know is under your control. Men may try to stop it. Men may try to slow it down. But it is you who keeps it marching forward. We know that that message will find those of you, those of yours uh, who will hear it. And it will have its intended effect on them. And that is to come to you. So, Lord, again, we thank you for this time together. Um, in your son's name we pray. Amen.